Okay, so I think we should get started. It's a really great pleasure to uh, welcome Leela Varghese to do a PhD completion seminar. Uh, Leela has been at WeHi for a few years now. She started um, as an honours student with James Murphy when he was in Doug Hilton's lab, uh, where she studied uh, the thrombo, uh, thrombopoietin receptor, MIPL. She had a rather tortuous route into my lab during her tortuous, not torturous, uh, route into my lab. She started off with, uh, with James and Doug. Um, she actually started her PhD studying the protein MLKL when uh, it was thought to be involved in uh, activating the JAK-STAT pathway. And it was partly through to her work that uh, we were convinced that that wasn't the case. By that stage, she'd obviously already fallen in love with the JAK-STAT pathway, so she decided to switch projects um, and look at uh, mutant JAK-STAT signaling uh, in various uh, uh, diseases. Um, she's been a terrific addition to my laboratory. The only thing I knew about her when she started with me was that she uh, had a background in physics, which I assumed A meant that she was cleverer than all of us and B, she'd be hopeless in the lab. But luckily, only one of those two things was true. <laughs> and uh, she's, been, uh, she's been absolutely fantastic to supervise over the last three or so years. She's incredibly hardworking. She's mastered a range of, well, a huge number of, of biological techniques, as well as keeping a hand in some more biophysical techniques, which you'll see in, this, uh, in her talk. Um, and as we've discovered recently, her supervisors and I, she is a superlative writer. Um, she, her, the first draft of her thesis required a couple of spelling, um, fixing a couple of spelling mistakes, and that's about it. Um, so without saying anything else, um, Leela is about to present her interestingly titled <laughs> completion <laughs> seminar. Um, and good luck. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> well, thanks for coming. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll just, I guess I'll just get on with it. Um, so it was a bit daunting to work out uh, what to talk about after being here for so long. But um, rather than try and convince you of some sort of made-up common theme to my PhD, um, instead I'm going to talk about my favourite protein, JAK2, and uh, how it's turned on and turned off in proliferative blood disorders. So hematopoiesis, the business of making blood, is ultimately dependent on the hematopoietic stem cell. So this rare cell is capable of, prol of proliferating and differentiating uh, into uh, uh, cells of more limited potential, eventually resulting in all the mature blood cell types. Now, this process is um, largely regulated by cytokines, which are a family of secreted signaling proteins. And uh, I'm most interested in the cytokines that control the production of myeloid cells, so granulocytes, erythrocytes and platelets. And these are granulocyte colony stimulating factor, or GCSF, GCSF uh, erythropoietin, or EPO, and thrombopoietin, or TPO. So, um, uh, how, uh, how cytokines are able to transmit a signal from outside a cell to the nucleus um, is through a cytok cytokine receptors, which are transmembrane proteins which sit uh, across the um, outer membrane of the cell. So these cytokine receptors are inactive in the absence of cytokine and don't have any intrinsic kinase activity. However, they're associated with a family of tyrosine kinases, the Janus kinases, or JAKs, and these are also inactive in the absence of cytokine. So upon ligand binding, uh, so cytokines are able to induce a biological response by... Um, causing the cytokine receptor to, um, to uh, rearrange in order to bring together the JAKs to um, transactivate each other. Now, this process of activation is not well understood, but it involves the phosphorylation of a flexible loop that in an inactive state sits within the active site of a JAK, but when phosphorylated, it flips out, allowing access of substrate to the active site. Now, these activated jacks are then able to do what kinases do, which is to transfer, um, to catalyze the transfer of a phosphate group from ATP to a target um, substrate. And in this case, it's specific sites on the cytoplasmic domain of the receptor. 
These sites um, are docking sites then for SH2 domain containing proteins such as the signal transducers and activators of transcription, which are, um, are recruited to the receptor and can then themselves be phosphorylated, whereupon they are released from the receptor and move into the nucleus where they, um, they activate a transcriptional program that results in processes such as differentiation, proliferation and survival. Now, there are many cytokine receptors, but only four JAKs. JAK1, JAK2, JAK3, and to be a bit different, TIC2. And as you can see, um, most of the cytokine receptors signal through JAK2. So um, cytokine receptors have been shown through genetic deletion studies to have preferences for particular JAKs, although how this preference is achieved is not entirely clear. In the case of JAK2, we know it's essential for red blood cell production because its genetic deletion in mice results in, um, in um, embryonic lethality. So these mice die around embryonic day 12 due to a lack of definitive erythropoiesis. And fetal livers from these mice don't respond um, to the homodimeric receptors, um, EPO, TPO, and TPO, and uh, others, as well as to the, um, the IL-3, IL-5, and, and GMCSF family of receptors. So the Janus kinases, or, or JAKs, um, are named after uh, their unusual feature, which is this tandem kinase and pseudokinase domain. So Janus is, is the two-faced Roman god. And I, I quite like that, being a former classics student. It gives me a, a little bit of a connection with my uh, former academic life. And um, uh, the, these uh, four jacks share a four-domain structure. So that's uh, receptor binding domains of the firm and SH2 domains. Then there's a pseudokinase domain, which for historical reasons is also called JH2, and I'll probably refer to it as JH2 quite frequently in this talk. And its role seems to be the negative regulation of the kinase domain. It's uh, called a pseudokinase domain because it lacks a key residue involved in phosphotransfer. But there's also a bona fide kinase domain, JH1, which provides the uh, enzymatic activity of, of the JAK uh, family of proteins. So the full-length protein has been notoriously difficult to purify and um, to express and purify. Um, and which has really limited some of the, the studies um, available of it. And when I started my PhD, it was only the kinase domain structure that was known. So this was determined by Isabel Lucet um, quite a few years ago now, and it looks like a typical kinase. That is, it's got an N lobe that's um, largely composed of beta strands and a larger C lobe, which is mostly helical. It also has other features which are pretty typical of a kinase, like uh, the activation loop here. Here it's shown in, in a position where it's outside of the activation loop, and these two tyrosines are phosphorylated. It also has the three residues which are considered to be essential um, for catalytic activity, and these are a lysine, which is involved in ATP binding, and two aspartates, which are involved in phosphor transfer and, and um, divalent cation binding, respectively, and these are on the C lobe side of the active site. Other features include a glycine-rich loop, which helps position ATP, and this prominent um, alpha helix in the N lobe, which helps position this key lysine. So the structure of the pseudokinase domain was only determined more recently, and it also looks like a kinase domain. It's got this uh, N lobe and C lobe and, an, and a pseudoactive site in the middle. Uh, it does lack that key aspartate involved in phosphor transfer, though. Um, but uh, we know from the structure and also from biochemical studies that it does bind ATP and has also been found to have a low level of kinase activity. However, we don't understand how the pseudokinase domain might regulate the kinase domain, and uh, this remains a, a point of interest. So there's a number of oncogenic fusions that cause... Um, JAK2 to be uh, constitutively activated and signal in the absence of cytokine. And uh, 
this results from uh, the fusion of dimerization domains such as TEL and PCM1 to either the kinase domain or the pseudokinase and kinase domain of, of JAK2. And these are quite rare, but they've been found to be in leukaemia such as um, T-cell acute lymphocytic leukaemia as well as um, B-cell acute lymphocytic leukaemia and both acute and myeloid leukaemias. However, the, a real interest in um, how the pseudokinase domain is, is functioning to regulate kinase domain activity has come out of the identification of a single point mutation of a valine to phenylalanine at residue 617, which occurs in the pseudokinase domain. Um, and this is common to a family of diseases called the myeloproliferative neoplasms. So these are essential thrombocythemia, polycythemia vera, and myelofibrosis. And um, it, it's uh, this uh, single mutation that's really um, uh, it brought a, a bit more of a flurry of activity in trying to understand how this pseudokinase domain is functioning. So collectively, uh, these diseases um, um, uh, have, have a have a, a, an overlap, some overlapping phenotype. But the major di diagnosis for cr um, criterion um, is now considered to be this mutation. Other features of these diseases include a sustained high platelet count in the case of essential thrombocythemia, uh, an increased hematocrit in the case of polycythemia vera and megakaryocyte proliferation and some bone marrow irregularities such as fibrosis or cellularity in the case of myelofibrosis. But this single mutation is the most frequently occurring mutation in um, myeloproliferative neoplasms. It accounts for most cases of polycythemia vera and about half of those with essential thrombocythemia and myelofibrosis. There's also mutations in other genes that cause um, these uh, myeloproliferative neoplasms, or NPNs. Uh, in the case of essential thrombocythemia and myelofibrosis, they tend to be genes that are associated with um, signaling through thrombopoietin, such as the thrombopoietin receptor, MIPL, um, as well as negative regulators such as LNK and Sybil. And you'll notice that these occur in the more sort of platelety and megakaryocyte type diseases and not at all in polycythemia vera. Um, and the last sort of piece of the puzzle was recently identified with mutations in cal reticulin, um, found to account for most of the other patients that don't have these other known mutations. Uh, it's not quite clear how cal reticulin is, is um, and the, the loss of its function is resulting in um, overactive JAK2, but this is something that I think is, uh, is um, people are really working on at the moment. But overall... Um, these diseases are, um, are basically caused by um, JAK that is activated when it shouldn't be. And, um, and yeah, that's seen by the mutations in JAK2 itself, negative regulators or its associated receptor. So since that initial discovery of the V617F mutation, there's been a number of other mutations that have been identified in, in, my, in proliferative blood disorders. And these, as you can see, occur mostly in the pseudokinase domain. There's two major hotspots, one around uh, V617F and another around residue 681 to 83. There's also um, a collection of mutations that occur in the linker region between the pseudokinase domain and the SH2 domain, and these are associated primarily with polycythemia vera. There's also a couple of mutations in the kinase domain itself, uh, and these are associated with um, childhood B-cell acute lymphocytic leukaemia. So we're able to map these to the known structures that we have of um, the pseudokinase domain and the kinase domain. And we find that they, they're, they're really grouping in specific areas. So V617F is um, in red here, and in magenta are the, are the um, nearby mutations in the pseudokinase domain, and at the top here are the um, exon 12 mutations, which are the ones in the linker region. There's also a group of mutations um, in green over here which correspond to these mutations up here. So while we know uh, what the structure of the individual domains are, we don't actually know how they interact and we don't have structures of uh, the two domains together. However, very recently, as in 
a couple of weeks ago, um, the only structure of a jack that contains both the pseudokinase and kinase domains um, was released, and that's of tick two. So this structure is, is quite interesting and shows that these two domains interact. And uh, if we map our, our, um, our JAK2 mutations onto TIC2, we find that the ones shown here in green and the ones shown here in grey um, actually map quite nicely to the interaction surface between the, the two domains. So it's likely that these mutations are disrupting uh, an interaction between the two. But the, the question has been for a while, though, is this interaction between the kinase and pseudokinase domain occurring in cis, so on the same uh, JAK um, protein, or is it occurring in trans? Because remember, JAKs act in pairs. They are activated in pairs. Um, it's quite possible that the inhibition between the pseudokinase domain and the kinase domain is happening um, in trans rather than uh, on the same JAK molecule. So this is the, one of the questions that, um, that I was looking at in my PhD. Um, ooh, ah. So um, looking at whether the pseudokinase domain on one jack is, in, is inhibiting the kinase domain on another jack or whether it's inhibiting itself. So uh, I use small angle X-ray scattering or SACs um, to look at a construct that included the pseudokinase domain and the kinase domain. So this is a, a low resolution technique. It's not gonna give you the kind of um, structural detail that X-ray crystallography will give. It's blobology. Um, but it does give useful information about the size and shape of a protein. So it should be able to distinguish uh, between a sort of a more elongated arrangement or a more compact arrangement, which would suggest uh, an interaction in cis. So this is what the intensity profile looked like of, um, of our JAK2 um, kinase and pseudokinase domain construct. So along the x-axis is radial Q, which at small angles is essentially the angle between the incident beam and the scattered beam. And along the y-axis is the intensity, and that's just in arbitrary units. So looking at this profile, uh, it doesn't really mean much. Uh, it's, it's not intuitive to interpret. But if we take the Fourier transform of this, we get the interatomic distance distribution function. And this is, and this is a, a much more um, a useful way of visualizing what we're seeing. So this is essentially a, a histogram of all the interatomic distances within the protein that we're looking at. So it, it shows us that the maximum dimension of the protein is about 135 angstrom. The shape of this curve also is, is indicative of the shape of the protein. In this case, it's reminiscent of um, a bilobe kind of structure rather than a, a more globular compact structure. And from what we know about the individual domains, the crystal structures show that they're about, each about six, uh, 60 angstrom. So even if their maxima aligned, it still wouldn't account for the maximum um, dimension that we see with our SACS data. We can also use a program called Bunch uh, with which we can um, determine the theoretical scatter of the two known crystal um, structures joined by a flexible linker and we can fit this to our SACS data. And this is the model we've ended up with um, from that process. And that seems to indicate that uh, the two domains are probably rather um, flexible and not in a fixed orientation in solution, and that they don't interact um, closely. So this is consistent with some of the cryo-electron microscopy that's been done of full-length JAK1, uh, which shows that, they don't, that the pseudokinase and kinase domains don't seem to have a fixed orientation in solution. So how do we explain the difference between our SAC starter and um, the crystal structure of TIC2? Well, I guess there's a number of ways we could explain it. Uh, simply, it could be that, that, the in, that this interaction in TIC2 is different from in JAK2. It could also be that we're looking at different structural snapshots of these proteins, so um, an uninhibited form here and an inhibited form here. Um, another... Uh, point to note is that the link between the pseudokinase and kinase domains in this structure 
um, can't be seen. So it's possible that um, we're actually looking at a, an interaction in trans between these two domains. Um, you can't actually say conclusively from the crystal structure. So other evidence that um, supports this model of an in-trans um, interaction between the pseudokinase and kinase domain has come out in a recently published um, manuscript in Science by Brooks and colleagues. And this is looking at um, the growth hormone receptor and JAK2 using FRET, and that's also supportive of this model. Um, other evidence is that um, uh, constitutively um, activating mutations in JAK2 also seem to release the inhibition of, other, of um, the activity of other JAKs, um, JAK1 and TIC2. And this was um, published a couple of years ago. So aside from the auto inhibition of the pseudokinase domain on, on the kinase domain um, that uh, regulates JAK activity, there's a number of other negative regulators that um, that prevent um, aberrant signalling in, in um, normal JAK signalling. So in the case of TPO, for instance, TPO signalling triggers not only um, STAT activation but also the um, PI3K and MAPK pathways. And these uh, can feed back to, uh, um, to induce the expression of negative regulators such as LNK and the SOX family of proteins. There's also a number of other negative regulators, such as the SHIP proteins, which are, are phosphatases, as well as um, SIBL, which I mentioned earlier. So we're particularly interested in the SOX family of proteins. Uh, these were discovered here at Weihai. Um, and um, the expression of SOX3 is uh, known to be induced by um, STAT3 activation. So the question is why in this case, uh, in the case of... Um, of JAK that is signalling even without cytokines, so these mutant JAKs, why are they not able to be negatively regulated by SOX3? Well, this is a question that has, um, has been uh, rather difficult to answer and there's been, um, there's been uh, a, a, quite a bit of controversy over this. So it was initially reported that the JAK2V617F mutation escapes negative regulation by SOX3, but others have disputed that. Um, we also know that SOX3 um, is potentially, um, is potentially uh, downregulated in its expression through methylation of its promoter region. So, um, Two of the things that I, um, I've been looking at in my PhD are the roles of receptor, uh, particularly the TPO receptor MIPL and GCSF receptor in uh, the JAK2V617F phenotype. <coughs> but also I wanted to look at whether SOX3 can inhibit JAK2V617F, whether there's anything intrinsic about these mutations which would prevent them from being inhibited by SOX3 and whether uh, SOX3 is able to potentially ameliorate disease. So there's, uh, there were three main tools that, um, that we used to look at these questions. Uh, one of them is uh, mouse studies uh, done with a, a model of, um, of myeloproliferative neoplasms, a JAK2V617F transgenic mouse. Uh, we're also able to um, look at these things in the test tube with um, purified recombinant proteins of the pseudokinase and kinase domains and SOX3. And lastly, we were able to um, try and, and, um, and uh, understand the interplay between receptor and mutant JAK in um, a cell line called BAF3 cells. So uh, Warren set up a, a number of, of, um, of, of crosses uh, um, with this JAK2 V617F transgenic mice to look at the roles of the TPO receptor and TPO um, in the V617F phenotype. So this mouse um, has a, a phenotype that's similar to the human disease, essential thrombocythemia. Um, and um, uh, through these, this breeding program, we were able to produce mice that expressed both the V617F transgene but lacked either MIPL, TPO, or TPO, uh, um, or overexpressed TPO. So the, the peripheral blood of these mice were examined 
And in the case of white blood cells, both for males and for females, um, no increase in white blood cells were, were found when the V617F transgene was induced on each background, so either wild type where MIPL was genetically deleted, um, in mice that didn't express TPO, and in mice that overexpressed TPO. Even though mice that overexpress TPO have a, a, an elevated white blood cell count compared to wild type, the V617F transgene didn't alter that. However, in red blood cells, you see an elevation of, um, of counts where the JAK2 V617F transgene is expressed. Uh, and you see this whether, or, whether um, the TPO receptor MIPL is present, um, whether TPO is missing, or whether TPO is overexpressed. And this we would expect because red blood cell numbers is, is, um, are controlled uh, more by erythropoietin receptor rather than TPO. In platelets, however, and uh, remember this is a, um, a log scale over here, the V617F transgene gene, um, uh, elevated platelet numbers, as we might expect, but when you, you remove the TPO receptor MIPL, uh, this same elevation doesn't take place. So mice that lack the TPO receptor MIPL have about 10% um, uh, of platelets of, as um, compared to uh, wild-type mice. Um, and mice that lack TPO have less than that, about 2.5%. Mice that lack TPO, however, um, are um, s still able to have this elevation in platelet numbers with the, um, with the addition of the JAK2 V617F transgene. However, uh, in the presence of high levels of TPO, as is the case with this TPO transgenic mouse, um, V617F doesn't increase that any further. So th these mouse studies have shown that MIPL is essential for JAK2 V617F uh, driven elevated platelet productions, but that TPO is not necessary. But it does modulate the effect to some extent. So we wanted to look at this further, and we used BAF3 cells to do this. So BAF3 cells are a really interesting model um, and useful model to look at receptor function, because these cells are IL-3 dependent and, and will die without cytokine. But you can install um, receptors that it doesn't normally express, such as MIPL, and get these cells to proliferate when you stimulate them with the appropriate cytokine, which is TPO. So we use these cells to um, to overexpress receptor in addition to either wild type JAK2 or mutant JAK2. So previous studies have shown that um, when you overexpress JAK2 um, V617F at high levels, they can proliferate without um, an additional receptor such as EPO receptor. However, um, at levels that uh, uh, closer to uh, physiologically um, relevant levels, I should say, it requires the EPO receptor in order to, um, to become factor independent. So we wanted to see whether this was the case with the TPO receptor and GCSF receptor. So because we, no we know that uh, expression levels of JAK2 V617F seem to be important in the phenotype that we see, we used an inducible expression system. So uh, we used um, a, a vector that was constructed by Toro Okamoto from um, the, formerly of David Wang's lab, and uh, this allows um, doxycycline inducible expression. So as we titrate in doxycycline, we see an in increased expression of um, our JAK2 construct. So um, we use this system to um, make lentivirus in 293T cells. The supernatant of this was used to spin in and infect BAF3 cells, so either parental BAF3 cells or BAF3 cells with either the TPO receptor MIPL or GCSF receptor. These uh, could be selected with pyromycin and then with treatment with doxycycline, we're able to induce the, uh, the overexpression of JAK2. 
Uh, the aim is to look at, at these cells um, in the absence of cytokine and see whether they are able to become factor independent. So first of all, I looked at um, BAF3 cells uh, with the TPO receptor MIPL. And uh, quite unexpectedly, um, I saw that as you increase JAK2 V617F expression, you, um, you see this, this um, change in morphology. Cells start to uh, cluster um, and become more adherent to each other. And when you starve these cells, you'd expect them to die. They are IL-3 dependent, remember. However, at low levels of JAK2 expression, um, of, well, JAK2 V617F expression, these cells are able to become factor independent. And this is the case even if you don't add any DOCs, which um, is probably explained by the vector being slightly leaky. So it's, it's, you're still getting this low level of JAK2 V617F expression even without adding any doxycycline. And as you increase JAK, uh, JAK2 V617F expression, you start to get these... Uh, morphological changes such as um, clustering and enlarged cells. But you don't see uh, proliferation at the same rate as you do with the cells where JAK2 is ex uh, V617F is expressed at low levels. So in a, in a growth assay where the cells are starved of cytokine, we find that, that cells um, overexpressing wild-type JAK2 die, but the combination of um, MIPL and JAK2 V617F allows these cells to become factor independent. But this is only at low levels of um, mutant JAK2 expression. At high levels, like I showed you in that previous slide, you simply get morphological changes. We also looked at what happens when you stimulate these cells with cytokine. So um, these cells were treated with low levels of DOCs for low levels of of uh, JAK2 overexpression. They were washed um, in factor-free media and cultured for two days. And IL-3 was then titrated in, or was titrated in, and then they were cultured for two days, I should say. Uh, and we see that all the cells respond to IL-3, as we would expect, but that the V617F um, overexpression um, uh, gives a, a sort of a basal... Um, level of um, proliferation. Similarly, we looked at this with um, TPO, so the same four cell lines, and um, found that cells without the TPO receptor MIPL don't respond to TPO, which is not entirely surprising. The cells with wild-type JAK die entirely. There's a, a basal level of, of um, survival in the cells with, um, without MIPL but with um, the mutant JAK, while when you've got both um, MIPL and mutant JAK, you get an enhanced uh, response to TPO, but you also get um, a proliferation in, with, uh, with low levels of TPO and, in fact, with no TPO at all. So next we looked at cells with, uh, with the GCSF receptor. And like we saw with uh, MIPL, uh, these, these cells um, uh, become morphologically different as JAK2 V617 um, expression increases. They become enlarged and they also start to adhere to, to the plate. So they, they look quite different. And when you start them, like the cells with the TPO receptor, they become factor independent again, even when you don't treat them with DOCs. Um, but as you increase um, JAK2 expression, you get again um, some morphological changes and a lot of cell death. So, rather like our result with the TPO receptor, we find that cells with both GCSF receptor and mutant JAK2 are able to become factor independent. Um, and this, again, is only at low levels of mutant JAK expression. So this is potentially explained by the gene dosage theory, which um, comes out of, which uh, supposes that um, it's the uh, expression level of JAK that determines the phenotype of the disease you see. Because there's only one mutation, and yet there's three diseases. So in humans, it's been observed that patients with ET tend to um, 
be heterozygous for the V617F mutation. Um, while there's a higher level of, of homozygosity for, um, for mutant JAK in patients with PV and MF. And this is also seen in mice where um, low uh, expression levels of, of V617F tend to give um, a more uh, ET-like phenotype and higher levels um, result in mice that have a, a phenotype that is more like the human P, um, PV or MF. So from this, we've learnt that when expressed at low levels, um, JAK2 uh, V617F requires a receptor, such as the TPRO receptor or GCSF receptor, in order to become factor independent. And uh, we're looking at using this system to dissect further what elements of the receptor we need in order to have um, constitutive activation due to the JAK2 um, mutant. We've also learnt that changes in cell morphology occur at high levels of mutant JAK2 overexpression uh, in combination with receptor. So this suggests that, uh, that there's overactive signaling in, the, in, in this case, but it's not clear what pathways are activated. So we looked at BAF cells with um, the GCSF receptor and either wild-type JAK2 or mutant JAK2. These cells were starved, then pulsed with GCSF, and um, we looked at downstream signalling. So not only were the, were the cells with mutant JAK2 um, constitutively activated, but JAK1 was also uh, constitutively on, as we're, uh, we're looking here at the phosphorylation of the activation loop. Downstream signalling um, was also um, um, constitutively on in the case of STAT3 and STAT5, and uh, we also saw SOX3 expression um, even in the absence of um, cytokine stimulation. So the question is really then, how come SOX3 is not able to feed back and inhibit JAK2 as we would expect? So to look at this, uh, we utilised our, um, our purified recombinant um, JH1, JH2 construct in a kinase inhibition assay. So as I said before, we can't expre uh, um, express and purify full length um, JAK2, but we can um, make this pseudokinase and kinase domain um, construct. So I introduced um, 14 mutations that occur in human proliferative disorders into this um, pseudokinase and kinase domain construct, as well as making um, a couple of controls. And, um, and looking at the activation loop phosphorylation, um, I found that they were all um, activated to a similar level as um, wild type. We also looked at two other phosphorylation sites which are associated with the negative regulation of JAK2. And uh, these looked quite similar, to, again, to wild type, except for the controls and except for where I forgot to load it there. So we used these constructs in an in vitro kinase um, inhibition assay. So here we're titrating in SOX3 and um, using radio-labeled ATP uh, to visualise um, the inhibition of, um, of uh, JAK2 in phosphorylating itself. So um, I found that all of these um, mutant JAK2s were able to be inhibited by SOX3 to a similar extent um, as wild-type JAK2. So there doesn't seem to be anything intrinsic about these mutant JAK2s that prevent them from being inhibited by SOX3. But we know from um, uh, biochemical experiments as well as from um, conditional um, knockouts in, in mice and, um, and as well as our structure of JAK2 in complex with SOX3, that SOX3 also binds receptor at the same time. So SOX3 only binds um, specific receptors and from knockout mouse studies, we've only, it's only been found to inhibit signaling through GP130, GCSF receptor and leptin receptor. 
and um, receptor uh, SOX3 uh, binding sites have only been um, validated in really these um, three receptors. So while SOX3 might not be particularly relevant for signalling through um, TPO and EPO, it should be able to inhibit um, signalling through the GCSF receptor. So why don't we see that here? Why is SOX3 not able to inhibit um, the activity of JAK2? Well, this might be explained in part by some work done by Sam Wormold and Doug quite a few years back, which uh, seemed to suggest that SOX3 um, should probably be thought of more as uh, an inhibitor of a, of a pulse of, um, of um, uh, cytokine stimulation. So in this case, where you have chronic IL-6 stimulation, the, the activation of STAT3 induces the expression of SOX3, which feeds back to inhibit STAT3. But in the, the state of chronic stimulation, a steady state is reached between levels of phosphostat-3 and SOX3. So that's probably what's happening in our cell lines and, and may explain what's happening in patients where this um, chronic uh, and, and constant activation of JAK2 is unable to be inhibited by SOX3. So in summary then, it seems that JAK2 disease-associated mutants are able to be inhibited by SOX3 in vitro, but in vivo, um, this activity is only really relevant to GCSF signalling and is unable to completely switch off constitutive um, JAK2 signalling. And to recap the previous stuff, we found that um, using small angle X-ray scattering that um, uh, it seems that the pseudokinase domain is, able, um, is most likely to um, inhibit the kinase domain in trans. We found that in mice, um, the TPRO receptor MIPL is essential for the mutant JAK phenotype that we see with elevated platelet production and that TPO modulates this effect um, to some extent. Um, I've also been able to show that with low levels of, of mutant JAK2 expression, you require a receptor such as MIPL or GCSF receptor in order for cells to become factor independent. But that at high levels of JAK2 expression, um, you see morphological effects and not proliferation. But this is only when you have um, the co-expression of a homodimeric receptor such as MIPL or GCSF receptor. So, uh, so where to next? I hope I've convinced you that uh, the interaction between JAK2 and receptors are important in disease. And um, that's something that, that really requires um, more work. We don't have a structure of full length JAK um, bound to receptor, although very recently this um, rather nice structure of tic 2 sperm and SH2 domain bound to a peptide um, from the interferon alpha receptor 1 um, uh, has been um, published. And, and, uh, and we don't, while we don't understand the specificity of particular JAKs for particular receptors, it really is a, um, a whole new area to look into um, and potentially um, is, a, um, is a, a novel target for the development of therapeutics that might um, disrupt this interaction and be used in the treatment of diseases such as myeloproliferative neoplasms. And uh, this is something that I hope to work on in my postdoctoral studies. So there's a, there's a lot of people to thank, and this is only some of them, um, mainly my supervisors, um, James and Jeff are the best supervisors ever. Um, I also have a, a very, very lovely committee. Um, particularly, I must thank Nick Nicola, who's been a pseudo-supervisor to me. He, he did think he was my supervisor, but he's not my supervisor. But he's put in a lot of work into getting me through my PhD, and I really appreciate it. Um, and the rest of my committee, Doug and Warren, have also been very supportive. I've now been in four divisions in WEHI. Um, there's a, a lot of people in there that um, have helped me along the way. And I'd particularly like to thank um, Sam Young, who's done a lot of um, uh, work, uh, has done a lot of work uh, doing molecular biology stuff and helping me out. 
Dina, for no particular reason. Everyone's got to thank Dina. Um, Craig and Jason did the mouse work that I spoke about. Um, Django and Kaylin um, and the Protein Lab are always um, great for advice. Tracy Wilson has made some constructs that I've used. Tom and Nick have provided me with SOX3. Eden's helped out with tissue culture. Um, Isa has been great to talk to for ideas. Um, Sandra and Ladina are ever helpful in lots of, of things. Ash has helped me with facts. Um, Toru, I need to thank for the vector, and Joe's helped me with lentivirus. And I also need to thank the people that, that pay me. They're very nice. And the Australian Synchrotron, where um, I did a lot of work. Thank you. Thanks, Leela. Um, I'm sure Leela would love to answer a few questions. <clears throat> or not. <laughs> Well, while everyone's getting ready, I'll kick one off. Um, so, do you think, in terms of high levels of V617X expression, when your cells are starting to look weird and, and change, were they trying to differentiate into something, do you think? Um, I, I think so. I mean, I couldn't work out what. Um, I um, tried some facts and other things to try and look at cell surface markers, which might indicate what they're trying to turn into. Um, but I, I really don't know. And I did show Don my slides and he didn't know either, so... so he doesn't know. <laughs> yeah, no. There, there's a lot to be done, I think, in trying to work out what they're actually doing. I can't remember, but did, has the same thing been shown with EPO receptor before? Well, they didn't say that that's what was happening, but um, the, they did have cells that survived and didn't die when you would expect them to die. Um, and they didn't explain that, so... It's a possibility. I haven't looked at it. Um, so, in thinking about the cis versus trans JH1, JH2 uh, kind of cytokinase interaction, um, now that uh, maybe maybe on the basis of that TIC2 structure, um, is there an experiment to be done there where you can make one protein that has a mutation that would interrupt? You know, if it were cis, but not if it were trans. Like, I haven't been able to think that through in the last 10 minutes enough to see if there was something, something there. But is there a sneaky way to, you know, co-express two mutants and figure that out? Um, I... Or get the threat from the Brooks paper pretty much sensible. Yeah, I guess. Well, they uh, I swapped, I think, um, a pseudokinase domain for a kinase domain or something like that. Um, but yeah, I, I guess that that's probably the easiest approach. Um, the problem with um, these other systems is that you either got you either got Jack two already in there if it's a cell based system, um, or you, you don't know whether you're whether you're looking at um, two of the of the same Jacks or whether you're looking if you say if you got say one that's kind of dead and one that's not say, uh, or whether you're looking at just uh, looking at just the one that makes sense. In other words, I have no idea. <laughs> that, yeah, that would obviously be interesting. Um, so the the firm has H2 domain of the T2 being solved with the receptor peptides. Can they solve the structure of the delta peptide? Or do you of the what, sorry? The firm has H2 structure yeah. of the T2. Yeah. They solve with the receptor peptides mm -hmm. onto it. Can you solve the have they tried to solve the structure of the delta peptide or is it necessary for the, to stabilise the construct or something? Um, that's a good question. It's the only structure of the firm SH2 domain, so presumably you, you need, require a receptor for stability, I would say, yeah. And if that's the case, um, in the JAK2, you, you, you say the future is like firm and HS2, <coughs> is probably for like the JAK2, do you know the receptor bit that the firm and issues to object to bond to binding to? Uh, well, it, it's probably the best strategy to take if you want to express the full length protein is to, to um, also have receptor there to stabilise. Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah that, well, that's the approach that um, is currently being taken by um, Jeff and Isa. Okay. Yeah. And you're saying, do we know which bits of the receptor are necessary for binding to the Oh, okay, sorry. Um, uh, yeah, so there's there's, um, there's two motifs of a receptor that are known to be jack binding sites called box one and box two. Um, 
but uh, we, we don't know conversely which sites on the firm and SH2 domain um, bind uh, receptor. And yeah, that's obviously something that is worth looking at. Yeah. Am I right in thinking Jack one and Jack two can heterodimerize or yeah. work together? So are the conserved are the regions involved in that interaction conserved between the two? Uh, what do you mean? Do you mean but it, it, the interaction between? Uh, Jack one and Jack two. Well, we don't know. So, so what I mean is the pseudo kinase domain, kinase domain interaction. Mm. Are the residues involved in that interaction conserved between the two? Uh, between tick two and um, or Jack and, one and Jack two, for example. Um, or well, we don't know because we don't have structures of the two domains, except for that tick two structure. Okay. Um, but uh, there's there seems to be some. Conservation of, of the residues in the tick two structure in Jack two, but it's not not entirely. So yeah, I think I haven't looked at it enough. It's actually hard to tell because they're so homologous already. Um, there's a few Jack specific motifs um, amongst the four different Jacks, and there's phosphorylation sites as well that are only found in Jack two, for example, and not Jack one. So I think it's likely to be more complicated than it currently appears. Yeah, so um, a few of those mutations too. They don't. They don't. They're not. Um, the sites are not conserved in Tick two. The Jack two mutations. So yeah. yeah. Have you looked at the equal expression on platelets from the Jack two mutation? No, but that would be um, really interesting to see if it's um, if it's down regulated. And also, have you, what age was the blood data from from that? I have no idea. I I have never been in the master. I understand that the disease gets more severe when you get older because they have two mutations. What's that? Sorry. That the disease gets so they get more severe disease when they get older. That's why I wonder. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah, well, that's a good point. It might be different. Okay. Well, if that's it, um, can we thank Lila again Thanks. for her seminar?